that in fact there are design features of language. By design, I don't mean anybody designed it. There are just intrinsic features of the nature of language that do show that you know, strongly indicate that language is designed as a system of thought and not as a system of externalization. Uh, notice that communication is a subcase of externalization. So it's not even secondary, it's tertiary. Uh, there's plenty of externalization that isn't communication. And there's nothing special, we now know. There's nothing special about the auditory articulatory mode of externalization. So sign works exactly the same way as far as anyone knows and uh, could turn up to work out in other modalities as well. Whatever it is, it seems to be uh, independent of sensory modality. Uh, the auditory mode has its advantages, and you could do it in the dark and so on, but uh, it doesn't seem to be intrinsic to language in any way. Uh, well, let's proceed. What is this uh, uh, mysterious uh, recursive operation that uh, somehow entered into our uh, evolutionary history. Uh, the first assumption you would make is it's the simplest one imaginable. Well, what's the simplest one imaginable? Any recursive procedure, any algorithm that's going to create a digital, a system of digital infinity is going to have embedded in it somewhere an operation that says take two units that have already been formed and make up a bigger unit. Okay, somewhere in any system you're going to find that, whether it's an axiom system or a Fragian ancestral or whatever mode you have for generating an infinite number of objects. So let's take a look at that operation. Let's assume that the, the initial assumption certainly is that's the operation that was provided to some not so remote ancestor. 100,000 years is not a long time from an evolutionary point of view. So some recent ancestor had some rewiring of the brain which gave them this operation. Uh, call the operation merge. Takes two objects already constructed, forms a new one. Well, uh, we'd want it to work in the simplest, we'd assume that it would work in the simplest possible way. Uh, the simplest possible way would mean that the two are, the two that are so in other words, I won't bother writing it, but suppose you have X and Y, you form a new object, call it Z. Okay, the most simple assumption is that X and Y are not changed by the operation. That's the minimal amount of computation, okay? They're not changed by the operation. That's called the no tampering condition. It's an elementary principle of uh, efficient computation. You want to put two things together, don't change them. Uh, that may, and furthermore, don't order them, because ordering them is more complex than leaving them unordered. Okay, what that means is that when you merge X and Y, you just get the set X, Y, period. Okay, that's the simplest operation, so presumably that... We start by assuming that that's the, the only operation. If we're forced to, we'll add more complexity, but that's the minimal form of universal grammar. Uh, you have a perfectly functioning operation merge. Uh, well, if you think about it, uh, there, can, there are two possible kinds of merge. We see that right away. Well, let me write it. So suppose we, we had X and Y. Uh, we want to merge them in the simplest possible way. And that will be the set X, Y. Okay. So for example, uh, in a linguistic case, we have uh, whatever that sentence was, uh, let's say tense and uh, swim and we have already, say, picked these out of the lexicon, and we merge them, and we get uh, the set tense swim. Uh, we add eagles on here, and we get this. Okay. Uh, there are two kinds of merge, just as a matter of logic. One of them will work like this. 
uh, you take two things that are formed, stick them together, don't change either of them. That's called external merge. The two things that you put together, eagles and this, are separate from one another. They're distinct from one another. That's one possibility. The other possibility is they're not distinct from one another. That's logic. Uh, well, uh, let's say this one is can. Uh, suppose we merge can with this whole thing. That's the case where they're not distinct from one another. Well, then we get can eagles can swim. Okay, That one's called internal merge. And those are the two kinds. I mean, if you think about the process of generation, there aren't any other kinds. You can't get overlapping sets. There's no way to construct them by this operation. So either the two things are totally separate from one another, or one is contained within the other. Well, if it's contained within the other, this one, then you get two copies of this. It appears twice. Okay. Now that's the simplest possible operation. You can only block it by stipulation. You'd have to add something to universal grammar to say you can't do it. Okay. Now, there are lots of approaches to formation of these constructions that are, you know, HPSG, uh, LFG, those of you who know the literature, which add complex operations. But they face two problems. One problem is why do they bar the automatically available operation? That's a stipulation. Second, why do they add the other operations? Now, I don't think either of those questions can be answered. Uh, so therefore, as far as I can see, the other approaches just aren't, you know, aren't, aren't in competition. Uh, they just involve too many stipulations. Now, there has, there's a historical reason why that's done. This, but it's of no, we can forget, we should forget it. The historical reason is that external merge was taken for granted, was assumed to be just available. Internal merge, which was called transformations, was considered to be, by me too, to be considered, it was considered to be something extra, you know, something you have to add on, because that's the way language seems to work. And therefore, there were many efforts to try to get rid of it. But when you think about it, you don't have to get rid of it. Uh, it's automatic. Now, if you take a look at the history of modern linguistics since the 1950s, a major effort has been to cut back universal grammar to try to show that it's not as rich and complex as was assumed. Uh, through the 1960s, the original assumption was that it included phrase structure grammar and transformational grammar. Through the 1950s, uh, phrase, uh, through the 1960s, uh, what do I do? OK. Sorry. Through the 1960s, phrase structure grammar was kind of whittled away. It has many stipulations and complexities. But they were sort of, the ways were thought of trying to overcome them. It led to what's called X-bar theory, which essentially eliminated phrase structure grammar pretty much. Uh, you could make further steps, but got rid of a lot of it. Uh, in the 60s and on, there were efforts to whittle away at the complexity of transformational grammar. And they reached uh, considerable success by, say, the 1980s. So you had two systems, but simple ones, simpler ones. Uh, the next question was, can we reduce them to the same operation? Well, that turns out to be possible, in fact, necessary, namely merge. They're reduced to the same operation. OK, now you've reached the limit, you know, aside from things you don't understand, which is enormous. You've reached the limit of what can be done to reduce universal grammar to its absolute minimum. If you can get away with this, that's the absolute minimum. To get away with it, of course, you have to show that everything else follows and that you can solve the, pro the poverty of stimulus problems. Uh, well, that's... Uh, that looks right, and we now have, you now notice something, that in the internal merge case, you pronounce the structurally highest element, but you don't pronounce the structurally lowest element. 
Well, actually, there's an economy reason for that, too. Uh, the pronunciation aspect, first of all, the notice that the what's given by internal merge is exactly correct for the semantics. For the semantic, for the thought systems, you do want to know that that element appears in two positions. It gets its semantic interpretation from uh, the original position. It gets its interpretation as a forming a question from its uh, derived position. And that's, uh, and you only pronounce the higher one. Well, that you find all over the place. Uh, so to take a different kind of case, uh, consider the uh, first and most famous uh, and most honored suicide bomber. His name is Samson. Uh, According to the Bible, uh, Samson was killed voluntarily. That is, he chose to be killed, and it was his great achievement. He killed more Philistines in his death than his entire lifetime. So he's the archetypical suicide bomber and highly honored. Uh, but notice that, that the words, we have the same problem, the same configuration here that we had in the yes or no question. The word Samson is heard, it's pronounced only in the hierarchically highest position, but it's interpreted in another position, namely the position which I indicated just by a slash, by a, by a, by a bar. Uh, it's interpreted as the object of kill. Okay, so something killed him. And it gets its semantic role, in, and that would be a position of external merge. But the raised position, the position of the actual sentence, uh, is one of, uh, it's gotten by internal merge, leaving two copies. And notice that it gets a semantic role in both positions. In its original position, it's understood as the object of kill. In its raised position, it's, uh, it's the subject of the predicate voluntarily. It's being killed that was voluntary, okay? So it gets two, two semantic roles, and they're different in character. Uh, one of them is called a theta role, one not, but it doesn't matter. It's getting two semantic roles in two positions. The internal merge is giving exactly the right structure for thought, but the wrong structure for pronunciation. In both the yes or no question and this case, the pronunciation is different. Why is it different? Well, there is an economy principle, simple one. Uh, articulation is a, a costly operation. It takes a lot of brain energy and takes a lot of articulatory energy. And you want to do as little of it as possible for economy reasons. Okay, so we have two economy principles. One that gives the two copies, one that, doesn't that only pronounces one of them. I mean, you have to pronounce one of them, otherwise you don't hear that uh, anything happened. And it has to be the hierarchically highest one, otherwise there's no indication that the operation took place. So the minimal uh, uh, computational operations will say, uh, construct the sentences by internal merge, yielding the semantically appropriate conclusions. That's fine for the language of thought. But then when you map it onto the sensory motor system, just pronounce the highest, the highest one. Okay, there's some interesting marginal exceptions to this, and there's an interesting literature about them, but I'll put that aside. The exceptions are, motiv are pretty well motivated, but the core principle is this, and it's, it's just universal, all over the place in language, all languages. Well, uh, there's a consequence. Pronouncing only one yields perceptual problems. You have to figure out where where's the other one. Uh, those of you who've worked on parsing programs or uh, perceptual models know that that's a very serious problem. In fact, it's the core problem in parsing. It's called a filler gap problem. 
you hear the word what in the front of a sentence and you got to figure out where it's coming from. I mean, that's the major parsing problem and similarly perceptual. And it's a very, it's a, it, these are trivial sentences, but when you get more complicated sentences, it's a very hard problem. And it turns out that there are copies all over the place and they all enter into semantic interpretation, but you don't hear any of them. Uh, so you get real uh, problems of interpretation. Well, if you notice, that's a problem of conflict between computational efficiency and communicative efficiency. The communicative efficiency would be far easier if you pronounced everything. Okay. Computational efficiency is better if you, if you pronounce only one. Well, computational efficiency wins uh, in the conflict uh, 100%. And furthermore, it's ubiquitous. It's true for all other constructions and all other languages. Uh, well, what, what, what do we conclude from that? We conclude that the actual design of language, the way it's sort of put together, uh, is for the purposes of semantic interpretation and computational efficiency. Communicative efficiency is sacrificed, which makes sense if that's a secondary process. You know, something comes along later, Okay, we do it in some complicated way. Uh, well, there, there are many other examples of this. So, for example, ambiguities. There are lots of ambiguous constructions, structurally ambiguous constructions. As far as we understand, they're all, anything we understand, it's generated by just letting the rules run free. You let the rules run free, you get ambiguity. That's bad for perception and parsing. Uh, there's a category of expressions called garden path sentences. It's the same. They are generated when you just let the rules run free, but they yield problems in perception and parsing. Uh, a more interesting case, which is only partially understood, or is what's called islands. Uh, there are certain expressions which you can think, but you can't say. Like if you have the sentence, uh, I, I wonder uh, how uh, John fixed the car or something. You can question the car and ask, which car did you wonder whether John fixed? It may be awkward, but intelligible. On the other hand, you can't question John. You can't say, who do you wonder how fixed the car? Uh, it's perfectly good meaning, you know, so you can think it, but you just can't say it. You have to find some circumlocution to express that thought. Okay, that's an island. Now, as far as we understand islands, and it's limited, they seem to come from satisfying conditions of computational efficiency, but they yield communicative inefficiency, actually in inefficiency even in ability to express your thoughts. So it's another kind of conflict. This is a research area, a lot of open questions here, but uh, and interesting ones. But it, where we understand anything, it looks as though computational efficiency wins out automatically over communicative efficiency, which is just not, an, not a relevant topic. Mike.